All right, welcome back to Around the Bases here on a Tuesday, October 22nd, 2020. Let's dive right into game two. As the Rays bounced back behind a dominant outing from Blake Snell, as well as a two-home run game from the previously struggling Brandon Lau to win game two, six to four. Some of the key storylines in this game, we have to start with Blake Snell, who was the pitcher uh, of the pitcher of the game in yet last night's contest. He struck out nine batters in four and two-thirds innings, and he took a no-hitter into the fifth inning before giving up a two-run home run to the Dodgers' Chris Taylor. Snell showed some incredible stuff in this outing. He became the first pitcher since Roger Clemens in 2000 to strike out nine and allow two or fewer hits in a World Series game. Of course, Clemens and his outing went something like eight innings, Snell four and two-thirds, as I should note that the Rays went back to the strategy that, that had got them there. You know, we just talked about that. They didn't leave Snell in long. They they had the quick hook for him after the after he got into a little bit of trouble in the fifth inning. As makes sense for Snell. He's a guy who hasn't gone six innings in a start since July of 2019. Something like that. It might be June. He doesn't go six innings much, and they, you know this is a, they're not afraid. He's had some previous health issues. The Rays often have a quick hook for him, but that doesn't mean his outing was any less dominant. Of course, he didn't give them as many innings, but four and two thirds innings, nine strikeouts. He really set the tone for the Rays to win six to four last night. The other player we have to talk about is Brandon Lau, who he was the best hitter for the Rays this season. He smacked fourteen home runs. In the 60-game season, he hit about 270. But he had cooled off down the stretch, and he was really struggling this postseason. He had a one home run, but he was hitting just 107 during the playoffs, entering last night. But the team and Kevin Cash, they stuck with him. He was in last night's lineup, batting second. He wasn't even moved down deep in the lineup, and it, it paid off. As Lau hit an opposite field solo home run at the top of the first or in the first inning off of Tony Gonsolin to put the Rays on top for the first time in the World Series. And that gave the Rays their 27th home run of the postseason, which tied a major league record for most home runs by a team in the postseason. In the fifth inning, Lau hit another opposite field shot. This coming after he had no opposite field home runs all regular season. He had a second in this game in the fifth inning, and that made it 5 to nothing Tampa Bay. And at that point, Lau had two home runs. Snell, a great outing. And that home run gave the Rays sole possession of the record. Most home runs hit by a team in a single postseason, 28, the 2020 Tampa Bay Rays. Now, should note, the Rays had more opportunities to hit these home runs uh, in that this wild card series round. There's just more games in this postseason, but still a remarkable achievement, especially the Rays getting to it here in just Game 2 of the World Series. Lau was the offensive MVP of Game 2 for the Rays, but the club also very notably had eight hits aside from his two. One thing to talk about here for the Rays offensively, aside for, from Lau, in the fourth inning, Dodgers second baseman Kike Hernandez, he botched an inning-ending double play ball, and that opened the door for Tampa Bay third baseman Joey Wendell to deliver with a two-out, two-run double into the gap. That gave the Rays a three-run lead. Of course, Lau homered again. Wendell picked up another RBI in the sixth inning on a sack fly for the Rays' sixth run of the game. And that's a really notable really notable development that the Rays were able to string together some hits and capitalize on a Dodgers mistake. The Dodgers aren't going to make many mistakes. But if you're the Rays playing the best team in baseball this year, you've got to capitalize on any mistake your opponent makes. And you've got to be able to string some hits together. We've talked about it. The Rays have been unable to do that this for a lot of the recent postseason, at least. They've relied on the home run, which has served them well. But it, it makes for a tricky, and like we talked about on Tuesday's show, it limits your avenues, the variety of your avenues to win. But we saw them string together hits in Game 2, and that's really notable from their perspective because if Lau is able to, is turning a corner here, breaking out of a slump, I mean, sometimes you have two home run games, 
and then it doesn't really mean much. But if he's turning things around, if he's getting on track, and that's going to be something we see better performance from him the rest of the way, that's significant in its own right. And then if you get this Rays lineup and they're starting to be able to string together hits with Lau and Wendell and you get G-Man Choi hitting well and Rosarena keeps hitting, all of a sudden you've got a team that's able to string together hits, maybe put together some big innings. Because if they're not able to do that, like we've talked about, then they got to hold the Dodgers to just a couple of runs. But if they can string together hits, if they can have some of these bigger innings then that gives them a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more of an opportunity to win games by a score of 6 to 4 instead of 3 to 2. So that gives them some some so that that's that's something that could be key for them moving forward. The Rays are now 19 and 0 this season, regular season and postseason when scoring 6 plus runs, the only undefeated team in Major League Baseball under those circumstances should also note the Rays struck out just seven times last night in Game 2. That's not a tiny number, but they'd averaged 11 strikeouts per game over their last 10 contests. So making more contact from their perspective, more frequent contact, fewer strikeouts, again, plays into this idea that the Rays could, if they're able to keep that up, have some of these bigger innings and string hits together and give themselves more paths to victory. Next takeaway here, the Dodgers did make this interesting in game two the Rays as we mentioned a 5-0 lead at one point the Dodgers were able to make things interesting but they came up short of a comeback late in this game Chris Taylor had that two-run home run in the fifth off of Blake Snell Will Smith the Dodgers catcher homered in the sixth inning and Corey Seager homered in the eighth inning more on him in a minute but six to four is as close as they could get Diego Castillo came on for the final out to pick up his third save of the postseason other thing you have to talk about from the Dodgers' perspective is they essentially went with a bullpen game, and it did not work out. They went with Tony Gonsolin to start Game 2, saving Walker Bueller to avoid. He could have started on, in Game 2, but it would have been on short rest. They decided they'll go with him Game 3, and they start Tony Gonsolin in Game 2. But he only got through an inning and a third. He gave up a Lau, that Lau first home run, and then they pulled him. Very quick hook for Gonsolin, who was essentially an opener for a guy who's not really, who's young, who doesn't have much experience as an opener. Very quick hook for him. And then Dave Roberts eventually used six other pitchers in relief of Gonsolin. Three of them gave up at least one earned run. The worst outing was from Dustin May. He was charged with three earned runs on four hits in an inning and a third. May and Gonsolin, two of the Dodgers' young pitchers that if, if helped them be able to continue to succeed from on the pitching side of things despite losing Hyunjin Ryu, despite losing um, Kenta Maeda. They've lost some of these veteran pitchers who've been huge for them, but they continue to be a great pitching team because of young pitchers like May and Gonsolin, who combined to post a 2.46 ERA during the regular season. But in the postseason, they've combined to, to pitch to a 7.02 ERA. The Dodgers are going to need them to do better the rest of the way. And Dave Roberts, Dodgers manager, said post game uh, on the pair uh, on May and and Raya, on May and Gonsolin, he said, according to the Associated Press, I still trust them, I still believe in them, and they've just got to make pitches. They're still going to need to get big outs for us, and that is certainly true. Because there's there's Kershaw, there's Bueller, there's Urias, but there's not a, you know there's not a ton of other like they're going to need big outs from these guys like robert said so that's going to be something to monitor moving forward dustin may and tony gonsolin can they get it figured out because they're part of it could be they're being used in roles they're not used to and maybe they're struggling with that but that's going to be something to keep an eye on moving forward the rest of the series also have to talk about Corey seager his incredible postseason has continued as i mentioned a moment ago he homered in the eighth inning of Game 2 last night. And that tied him with Randy Orozarena for the MLB lead in home runs this postseason with seven. It also gave Seager a new record for the most home runs hit by a shortstop in a single postseason with seven. 
We've talked so much about a Rosarena. He's been this big storyline. He's been this big breakout. And that's certainly deserved attention. But Corey Seager has been having an incredible postseason. Most home runs hit by a shortstop in a single postseason. we still got a couple games to go at the very least in this World Series. Seager completely locked into the plate. He's hitting 302 with an OPS close to 1,200, 7 homers, 16 RBI, and he also has 2 steals for good measure. So those are some of your Game 2 takeaways. A couple of other items, just sort of smaller items I wanted to tack on here in talking about Game 2. First is Randy Orozarena. He singled in the ninth inning yesterday, his first hit of yesterday's game. To tie Derek Jeter for the most hits by a rookie in a single postseason with 22. Also, Randy Orozarena now ranks second in total bases by a player in a single postseason ever. As in, only one player has ever had more total bases in a single postseason. And that's David Freeze in 2011 for the Cardinals. Freeze had 50 total bases in that postseason in 2011. Rose is currently at 48. So he just needs three bases to become the player with the most total bases in a, post, in a postseason ever, which is just incredible, just remarkable. This is coming from a rookie that most people didn't know a thing about a couple months ago. Other quick item to hit on here, Tampa Bay first baseman G-Man Choi became the first Korean-born player to ever record a hit in a World Series when he singled to lead off the sixth inning of Game 2. Sticking with the Rays, their reliever Nick Anderson, he was one of the best in baseball during the regular season. He posted a 0.55 ERA. But Anderson has really struggled in this postseason, particularly of late. He's posted a 48 Eight five ERA in the playoffs, and he's given up at least one earned run in five straight appearances, including last night. Anderson gave up just one home run in 19 regular season appearances. He's now given up three home runs in eight postseason appearances. So he seems to have lost it right now, and that's not to say that he can't get things turned around in a hurry. He is one of the best relievers in baseball. But he just doesn't have it right now. And that's not... That's not devastating for the Rays, considering the amount of options that they have that Kevin Cash is willing to go to in late innings. But it is becoming a situation where are they going to trust him in high leverage, high leverage roles moving forward to the World Series? I feel like right now he's probably got to prove it. He's probably got to go out there in a, a less high leverage role and, and show that he can get it done before they're willing to stick him back in there in the big situations, whether those big situations are closing out a game with a one-run lead in the ninth inning, or coming on in a big situation in the fifth or sixth inning, as they've done with him some this postseason. Uh, he's there, you know, he's been their best reliever this year, but it wasn't that he was their set designated closer all the time. He was their closer a lot of the time, but he also came in in high leverage situations in the seventh, in the sixth, in the eighth. So it'll be interesting to see how they use him moving forward. I feel like at this point they're probably going to have to move him down in the pecking order in terms of guys who they're willing to trust for high leverage situations. There are several other guys. That's what makes this Rays team so good. One of the aspects of it is that it's not a situation where, oh no, we have we have the star closer and he's falling apart. What are we going to do in the later innings? We're, we're lost. Because they just have so many guys who they can throw out there. They had so many guys who got saves this year, like... Like, they don't care about the closer's tag and, oh, no, has this guy pitched in the ninth before? Like, they're going to go with who they think can get them the outs, and they don't care about the traditional roles. That was true. That's true in the starter side of things. We talked about that. That's also very, very much true in the bullpen. But, again, the point of this the point, of this point uh, Nick Anderson, incredible reliever, but he continues to struggle in the postseason. All right. Uh, so what's, So that's what you need to know from Game 2. And that's where we are right now. Again, sort of your summary. Dodgers win game one, eight to three. Kershaw was great. Mookie was Mookie. Dodgers had offensive contributions throughout. The Rays offense couldn't get things going. And the Rays deviated from their normal pitching plan. They left uh, they left Tyler Glass now out there a lot longer than they usually would. 
Game two, the Rays bounce back. Blake Snell was great. Brandon Lau breaks out of his slump. Dodgers can't come back. Their pitching carousel doesn't work out. And Corey Seager continues to do awesome things. 